All right, well, welcome to Connect Worship. You know, I've, I've been praying a lot that God would teach me flexibility. Hmm. And so God's been doing that in the midst of these COVID times. So we are staying really flexible as a worship service today. Because we were really excited. We had Kayla Delgado who was going to come and lead worship. And then Kayla got really sick. And we found out last night that she could not join us. So, you know, I've had a lot of firsts in this COVID time. The first time ever doing this. The first time ever doing this. I think this is the first time we will ever have a worship service with no music. <laughs> have, have you had that before? Okay, there's, there's five of us in this room. None of us have experienced that before. I thought I could lead worship on the cajon. But I don't think God would appreciate that. <laughs> I think God was like, no, it's okay. You don't need music. And so we are going today totally different style. We are here to worship, but we're not going to have music to do that. And I think it actually kind of raises a really good question, like what is true worship, right? Like what's needed? Do you need music to have worship? Do you need a sermon to have worship? And I think these COVID times have been raising a lot of these uh, questions about the form and the substance. And so I've just been coming back to that verse where Jesus says, you know, folks are, you're worshiping me in vain because you're honoring me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. So the only thing we need to actually worship God is to bring our hearts to God, to bring that offering of praise. And so that's what I want to invite us to do, to bring our hearts to God today and to do that without music, which I think is actually really challenging. But we're going to start with a psalm, and, and I'm going to read Psalm 103. And I just want to read this psalm to usher us into God's presence, because we know God is here. God is present with us, but we want to draw our mind's attention and our heart's affection into God. And so he, this uh, is uh, Psalm 103, which is uh, my wife Cindy's favorite psalm. And so we find these words. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases and redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies the desires with good, your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. As for mortals, their days are like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels. You mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts. You his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works, everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, O my soul. So we're, we're invited here to forget not all of God's benefits. We're invited here just to remember who God is and what God has done. So I want to invite you just wherever you are, if you're with others, just take a moment to turn to them and just share one of God's benefits. 
Just one thing you're grateful for, of who God is or what God has done. As you think back on your week, as you look at your life, just take a moment to share with each other one thing you're grateful for. One attribute of God you're grateful for. How about for us? See, we're, there's only five of us in this room. So you guys share with each other. But I'm going to call out. Amber, what's one thing you're grateful for this week? Uh, time with my kiddos. All right. Amber is grateful for time with her kiddos. Danelle. Cooler weather. She is grateful for cooler weather. And I'm very happy for cooler weather myself. All right. My brother-in-law, Michael, is here. Michael, what are you grateful for? Rebecca. Ah, he's grateful for his wife, my sister, Rebecca. That's a good answer. That's a good answer. <laughs> Rebecca, what are you grateful for? Well, we still need to exercise. I'm grateful for you. He's grateful for me. We're grateful to be with Blue Sky because inviting Blue Sky is something very just, well, you know, ask for people. All right. So we're grateful for Blue Sky. Rebecca and Michael are grateful for Blue Skies because they live in Reading and the skies have been covered with ash and have been gray for weeks. And so they're grateful for Blue Skies. I'm grateful that they can be here. They just dropped off their daughter yesterday in college. And Rebecca, my sister, is leaving tomorrow for Mozambique. So my family continues to be all over the world, and I'm grateful that God meets us wherever we are. So it is with grateful hearts that we come into this time of worship, and I'm going to invite uh, Amber to come and to read today's scripture passage for us. Good morning. Our scripture today is found in Mark chapter 1. Verses 16 through 18. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. The word of God for the people of God. All right. So we are just, we are stream streamlining our live streaming today. <laughs> this may be the quickest I have ever jumped into a message. This could be an all-time record. Some of you are probably really excited. There are probably a few of you out there that are like, wow, this is going to be a really short worship service. We're being flexible, folks. That's where we're at. So it is almost September. How many days away? Two days away. It's almost September, which means it's pumpkin spice season. <laughs> yeah. So I do want to ask you, <laughs> I do want to ask you, what's your favorite pumpkin product that's coming out right now? If you go to Trader Joe's, there's got to be a dozen or more. Is it pumpkin spice lattes? Is it the bread? Is it the snacks? Share with us your favorite pumpkin-inspired theme, okay? I'm kind of excited about that when September rolls along. I heard earlier that there is pumpkin-flavored ice cream. Yes. Okay, so I'll be looking for pumpkin-flavored ice cream. And I'm kind of excited about that. But you know what I'm really excited when September hits? I'm excited about football. I am excited about football. I'm excited about watching Bobby Okariki, who's a member of our church, play for the Indianapolis Colts. I'm excited about watching the Seattle Seahawks win the Super Bowl. Praise God. And I'm really excited about Beckman's ninth grade football team. Yes, they already had their first game. They play on Thursday afternoons at 3.15. <laughs> they had their first game, and our son Daniel is on that football team. And I share safety concerns about football. I'm sure some of you have those safety concerns. But I just really love football. And what I love about it the most is the teamwork. I love just this dynamic where this group comes together and they just say, we are going to work hard for one common goal, one common purpose. And we're going to do that by pursuing individual roles, individual assignments. Same purpose, different assignments. I love that about football. You see that with Beckman's ninth grade team. They have two players on their team that weigh over 300 pounds. Woo! Ninth graders. And as you can imagine, their coaches are really excited. <laughs> they are so excited to have these big boys on their team. Now, these 300 pounders, they're not playing wide receiver. No. They are on the line. They're offensive linemen, defensive linemen. 
My son Daniel, he's not quite 300 pounds. <clears throat> he's way under that. He's not on the line. He's a wide receiver. Same purpose, different assignments. And, and last week, Pastor Ken talked about the difference between our purpose and our assignments. And I know that resonated with a number of folks. And so I want to pick up on that and build on it this week. Every Christian... Every disciple of Jesus Christ has the same purpose. And this divine purpose doesn't change. And and today's very brief scripture passage, which Amber just read, is, is for me the clearest, simplest way of stating our purpose, our calling. Jesus says to Simon and Andrew, follow me and I will make you fish for people. That's our purpose, to follow Jesus. To follow Jesus and in doing so to become like him. To do what he's doing. See, what's Jesus doing in in this scripture passage we just heard? By inviting Simon and Andrew to fish for people, he's fishing for people. He's showing them what they're going to do. So in essence, Jesus is saying, follow me and learn to do what I do. Follow me and learn to live as I live. Follow me and become like me. That's our purpose. That's our calling, to follow Jesus and become like him. To live out his message and mission in the world. And and that's our purpose, whether we're 22 or 82. Whether uh, we're a student, uh, a real estate agent, a pastor, or we're retired. Um, Whether we're single, married, divorced, whether we live in Tustin or Las Vegas. That's our purpose. To follow Jesus and become like him. And this purpose remains the same throughout our lives. But our assignments change. The way we live out this purpose changes with each season of life. See, I'll put it this way. God's purpose for my life remains the same. But in each season, my assignments change. God's purpose for my life remains the same, but in each season, my assignments change. Michael and Rebecca's daughter just dropped off at college yesterday. You head off to college, your assignments change. Or if your kids go to college, your assignments change. If you retire, switch jobs, your assignments change. If circumstances change, I mean, when COVID hits the world, our assignments have changed. In each different season, the assignments that God has for us may change, which begs the question, how do I know what my assignments are? How do I know what God's specific call is on my life right now, this fall? What's my assignment this fall? That's the question that we're going to explore this morning. And to do so, we're going to use a visual tool. A discernment triangle that was developed by a former pastor of mine named Daryl Johnson based on his study of a number of different biblical characters. And we're going to work our way through this discernment triangle, and I want you to fill it out as we go along. So, yes, we don't have music today, but we do have something you need to do with a sheet of paper. All right, here's what you need. You need a piece of paper. This is really complicated. I'm only kidding. All you need is a piece of paper. Make it 8.5 by 11 because I want space for you to be able to write on it. And on this eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, all you gotta do is draw a big triangle, okay? And we're gonna put six different elements on this triangle. I don't know if you can see this. I don't know if you can see this. This is what we call high tech worship. All right, so what you're gonna do, there's gonna be six elements and there's gonna be pairs of them on each corner of the triangle. Okay, so please grab a piece of paper and a pen because this is going to be really specific and I think it's going to be something that you can reflect on later on. So grab that piece of paper, grab a pen. I'm going to lay out these six elements and uh, the way they work, they're in pairs because each corner of the triangle, there's two elements that are actually in tension with each other. So I'm going to explain what I mean by that just by jumping right into our triangle. So, and I know Danelle's going to put each of the elements in the comment section. But once again, please take notes. Please take notes. Here's the first element. Appropriate strengths slash gifts. Okay? If I feel called by God, 
to become the next K-pop star. It might help if I know how to sing, right? I'm just saying, that might help. What I do needs to flow out of who I am. And each of us has unique gifts and skills. Each of us has unique strengths. And God wants us to use our strengths. And here's why I think that's important. Because I think we tend to ask, what do I want to do? Like, well, what do I want to do? And that's a helpful question. But we live in a world of infinite options. So that can be an overwhelming question. What do I want? See, Scripture invites us to ask, what am I good at? What am I good at? And to flow with our strengths. To let our assignments come out of our strengths. There are so many examples I could give of people that are doing that. But I just want to give one from our church campus. Because uh, we have a, a retired member actually of Connect, Herb Chatterton. Hi Herb, I hope you're joining us today. But Herb is someone to me who I love the way that just the way he serves. His assignment, his understanding of it flows out of his strengths and his gifts. He worked in that area of, of property management and overseeing crews that were in charge of that. And now you will see him throughout our church campus doing projects that I could never do. <laughs> Every project he does, I'm thinking, I would have called a handyman for that. But Herb's like, I'll do it. Even yesterday, I came to church, not expecting to see anyone, go in the church office. There's Herb. There's wires coming out of the wall. He's on the floor with a just, you know, screwdriver in his hand. He says, I'm working on the emergency lights for the fire department inspection. He does wiring. He does walls. He does windows. He does plaster. He does drilling. He does so many projects, and he has gifts and strengths that I do not have. But out of those strengths, he's serving. He's found his current assignment right now, which is blessing so many others. So I want to simply ask you this question. What are you good at? What are your strengths? And I want to invite you to write that down on your piece of paper. You can do this more later on. But right now, just what are you good at? What are your strengths? Rebecca, what are you good at? Talking. Talking. All right, there we go. These guys don't know I'm calling on them today. But all right. Amber, what's, what's one of, what's, what are you good at? Um, art. Art. All right. What are your strengths? That's the first one, appropriate strengths, gifts. Here's the second element. And the second element is on the same corner of the triangle. Okay? We're going with the bottom right-hand uh, corner of the triangle right now. But this is on the inside of that triangle. It's reliance on God's power. The second element, reliance on God's power. Think about folks in the Bible who are given a specific assignment from God. Abraham and Sarah, Moses, Esther, Paul, Mary. Did any of them hear their assignment and say, piece of cake, no problem, I got this. No! Every single one of them heard their assignment and said, you want me to do what? God, without your presence, without your power, there's no way this is going to happen. Take the Apostle Paul. Paul had a really clear assignment to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. And he had the appropriate strengths and gifts to do this. The theological training, the public speaking skills, etc. But at the same time, he was very much aware of his own weakness and his reliance on God's power. Often, when God calls us into something, it's risky, it's bigger than us, it's not easy, it stretches us, it puts us in a place where we say, God, I don't think I can do this on my own. And God says, exactly. And this is what keeps us depending on God, even as we're operating within our own strengths. I can give a lot of examples of this from my own life, but I think probably a real obvious one for me is connect. It's this new ministry. We have a team of folks. We're living out our strengths. We're giving this our best, but we totally know, all of us invested in this, we know that God, this is going nowhere without God, without your power and your presence. When you, when you try to start something new, it's like, God, you've got to breathe new life into this. You've got to move. Your spirit's got to move in this because we can't just do this. There's no sense of like we're self-sufficient in this. We're giving it our best, but we're totally relying on God's power to move. 
And you see that again and again when God gives someone an assignment. So I want to just invite you to ask this question. Uh, are you feeling called to do something that's risky, that's challenging, that, that, that's going to stretch you? Is there any sense you have where you, go, where you go think, you know, I've got this idea, but I don't know if I can pull it off. That could be God giving you an assignment. So I want you to write down, if there's any thoughts that come to mind with those questions, write them down. See, and as God is leading us, there's a healthy tension between these first two elements. We're using our strengths, yet we're relying on God's power. All right, now we're going to the third element, a new corner of the triangle. The third element is willingness to go first. I invite you to write that down on your piece of paper. Willingness to go first. In Acts 20, Paul is compelled by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem, even though the church leaders tell him, don't go, it's too dangerous. See, often there's an element in our call in which we realize, even if no one else has committed to this yet, I'm going to do it. There can be the sense, I must do this. I cannot not do this. Even if others don't fully understand or back me. I will not simply wait for others to, to come on board. I will step forward first. A willingness to go first. To be the one who steps out and does it. And I think this is an important element for us today, especially given how much our culture and our church is changing. There's just so much change going on around us. Uh, leadership expert Thomas Friedman writes, We need 100,000 people in 100,000 garages trying 100,000 things in the hope that five of them break through. All right, students, youth, worshiping with us right now, I hope you heard that. We need 100,000 people in 100,000 garages trying 100,000 things in the hope that five of them break through. We need you stepping out and doing things that you haven't seen anyone else do. That's what we mean by a willingness to go first. Now, when I think about this element... Several different people come to mind, but one of them is sitting in our room, and her name is Amber Rain Jenkins. And so uh, Amber has a heart for art. She mentioned that before. She's a great artist. Her art is all around us. <laughs> um, a great artist, and she really has a passion for racial justice. And God's been speaking to her about those two. And God's been giving her assignment that's been formulating and percolating and she's been working on in the sense of like, how can I do an art installation that provides a space for people to really be heard, where we can listen to those who've been hurt, who've experienced racial injustice, not just in society, but in the church, and where there can be a space to lament and grieve and really listen. And yet art can play a part in that, but the art would not be in the church, but out in the community in an open space, in an installation that would be mobile and move around. And there's this idea, and it's like God's giving her this assignment, but it's not like something she's seen. <laughs> she can't say, well, five other people have done this, so this is what we're going to do. So she's just reflecting on that and communicating with others about that. But she's not just kind of waiting for others to try it first. It's like, nope. I've got this. This is something God's put on my heart. This is an assignment that God's calling me to do. And I'm willing to go first and to pursue it. So I, I want to just ask you once again, is there anything in your life where you think, I, I got to try this. I, I, I cannot not do this. Anything come to mind there? If so, I invite you to write that down. That, that, that could be a way that God is speaking to you about an, an assignment that God has for you right now. Here's the fourth element on the same corner of the triangle. The left corner of the triangle, confirmation of others. So first, right, a willingness to go first, but then confirmation of others. In Acts 13, the church at Antioch prays together. And as they pray, they sense that, that God is calling Paul and Barnabas go, to go leave for new missionary work. And so they lay hands on them and they send them out. So Paul and Barnabas have the confirmation of others before they start this new assignment. See, we're in the fellowship hall right now, 
of our church. And maybe you feel that uh, feel called by God to turn this fellowship hall into a roller skating rink. Now that could be a great idea. I don't know. Who thinks that's a good idea? All right, Michael loves the idea. What do you think if we led worship from a roller skating rink each week? Well, you might have that idea, but you probably want the confirmation of others before you go forward with that plan. See, and I think this is actually a really challenging element for us because we live in such an individualistic society. We live in such an individualistic culture that the confirmation of others is not something that we seek out. Especially when it comes to major life decisions like school or career or dating or marriage or moving. I mean, just these decisions. And and scripture just invites us to, to receive wise counsel, to seek the wise counsel of others in making these decisions and discerning like what God might be saying to us. We need the input of others to figure out our assignment. Uh, Parker Palmer is an educator, an author. He wrote a great book called Let Your Life Speak. But he tells a story in that book of being offered the position of a president of a small college, which in his field is like the pinnacle, right, of your career. Like, no brainer. They want me to become the president of their college? But uh, he's Quaker. And so in that Quaker tradition, he brought together a clearness committee, what they call it, but he just brought together six trusted friends who would sit down with him and ask him open, honest questions to help discern what God was saying to him in that. And as they asked him these questions, and as he responded to them, eventually he actually realized, I love the idea of being president, like my name and president underneath it. Like, I love the idea of being a president, but I'm not drawn to the work of a president. And after that group of friends met with him and discussed this, he called the school and he removed his name from consideration. And his experience reminds us of the importance of including others in the discernment process. So let me ask you this question, invite you to write down what comes to mind with this question. What counsel have you received recently from family and friends? What counsel have you received recently from family and friends? Willingness to go first. Confirmation of others. As God is leading us, there's a healthy tension between these two. All right, here's the fifth element. And this is at the top corner of the triangle. Fifth element, the needs of the world. God calls us to love and serve others, period. The more we experience God's heart, the more we are moved by the needs of the world. And there's so many people in our Connect community who I see addressing and seeking to love the world. Um, But I just want to share about one person. I was actually just talking to him on Thursday, uh, but his name is Tyron Jackson. And Tyron lives here in Tustin, and uh, he works for Tustin Unified School, but he also started and runs a, a nonprofit, a local nonprofit called Operation Warm Wishes. And it's a nonprofit that's seeking to bless homeless families. And that's the need that Tyron has just zeroed in on. Homeless families. Last month, I joined him at a, a local pizza parlor for the, a birthday party for homeless kids. It was just a birthday party for any, any uh, homeless children that showed up. Uh, last Friday, uh, Tyron just dropped off 100 uh, backpacks for school kids. Yesterday, he was at Pepper Tree Park <laughs> uh, serving as well. He just has this passion to address that need. And uh, I find it inspiring. When I went to the pizza parlor, that birthday party, uh, I met high school students. (laughs) Beckman High School, Tustin High School, Foothill High School. They all have Operation Warm Wishes clubs. And it comes out of uh, Tyron's desire to meet this need. And he understands the need because when he was a student at Tustin High School, he was homeless for two years. And he knows the challenges of being a student in that situation. So that's a need that he's addressing. So what are the needs that move you? I invite you to just write that down. What are the needs that move you? What are the needs that make you hurt? That make you say, someone's got to do something about this. The needs of the world. Here's the sixth and final element. My greatest passions. My greatest passions up on the same top corner of the triangle. What are you passionate about? What makes you excited? 
Michael, what makes you excited? Seeing people excited about the Lord. Seeing people excited about the Lord. They didn't know I'm doing this. All right, thank you. Thank you. I, I mean, we have so many people who could speak here today. It's pretty awesome. But what are you passionate about? What are you excited about, right? Maybe you think, I love math. I love playing the guitar. I love Santa Ana. I love poetry. I love working on old cars. Every one of those passions can be used to serve and follow Jesus and become like him. I lead a Bible study on uh, Tuesdays. And uh, there's two members of the, the Bible study who just say, you know, I love the Old Testament. And they both said, I love the book of Jeremiah. <laughs> and so in September, they're starting a Bible study on the book of Jeremiah. What do you love? I invite you to write that down. What are you excited about? So the needs of the world, my greatest passions. Here's, here's how these two come together. I love how Frederick Beekner puts it. He writes, the place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. The place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. Where is that place for you? Now, in this worship service, without any music, that was a mouthful, right? I mean, this triangle, whether you've been writing down things or not, it's a tool that has helped me answer the question, what am I supposed to do? What's my assignment in this season of life? But I realize that there is a lot to reflect on <laughs> in what we've discussed just this morning. So here's what I want to invite you to do. And, you know, we can send you, if you want to see the six elements, if you want a copy of the triangle, we'll send it to you. But I want to just invite you to take this triangle, reflect on it, and then discuss it with one person you trust. Just sit down and think, you know, what kind of ideas does it spark? What kind of questions does it raise? As you reflect on the elements within this triangle, is there anything you sense God is saying to you or inviting you to do? And I want to encourage you to get as specific as possible. Like, here's my assignment. Here's my assignments this fall. And I want to encourage us to get specific, to, to get practical, because I think for many of us, we're in hibernation mode. <laughs> It's like, we are in hibernation mode. It's like, I mean, my wife, Cindy, and I, we joke about this all this time, but things we used to do, like, I don't want to go out. I don't want to see people. I don't want to do this. I'm, I'm in hibernation mode. So I think we're in hibernation mode. I think we're overwhelmed by what's going on in the world. It's so overwhelming. Like, when I pick up my phone and look at my, my news apps, and, and I think <laughs> our pre-COVID assignments have been so disrupted and turned upside down that many of us, we're, not, we're just not sure what to do now. So I want to invite you to use this triangle to just ask a very simple question and identify one assignment that you think God is calling you to this fall. And as you reflect on that, I want to close with this reminder. We all have an assignment. Every single one of us has an assignment. And it doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are. It doesn't matter if your health is strong or if your health is deteriorating. It doesn't matter if, if you're feeling carefree or if you're struggling with depression. Each and every one of us has an assignment. Jesus is saying to each of us, Jesus is saying to you, come, follow me. <laughs> Join me in my mission. You've got a role in this. You've got a part to play. You've got strengths and gifts that our team needs. Whether you're a big old lineman or a skinny wide receiver, you've got contributions to make. Each of us has an assignment. We have an assignment. And this fall, let's pursue our assignment. And let's do so trusting that as we do, God can work through us. God can work even through us to bring healing and restoration to our broken, battered world. Amen.
I'm going to invite Amber to come and lead us in a time of prayer. First of all, I want to thank Tim for his flexibility. He is always an amazing example of just rolling with the space the Holy Spirit leaves available. So um, it's encouraging to be a part of a community that can roll in the realness of the unexpected in life. So I just want to include a special blessing for him and his leadership in that and the peace that he brings to this space. Um, that has definitely been a very specific assignment of his in my life. So I am grateful for him for that. So join me in sending him a text this week and telling him good job. So, um, so pray with me. Lord God, um, I love that you want to do stuff with us. You just want us to do stuff with you. You want to hang out with us. You want to be involved in it. In fact, you could do it all yourself. Your breath, your thoughts, your imagination created everything around us. And yet, you said, hey, come do this with me. Come follow me. I want your thoughts, your engagement, your unique perspective to affect the people I love and created. Big or small, whether it's leaving a note in your kid's lunchbox, or changing the face of Christian culture. All of it and any of it is so eternally worthy to you. I love that you don't have a hierarchy. You just want to be with us. So God, I ask that your Holy Spirit would infuse hopefulness, consistency, and sustainability in each of us and that you would bring as many people alongside of us to tell us our ideas are good and worthy as our own hearts tell us that they're not. God, I ask that you would raise the level of the Holy Spirit's presence in each of us to affirm that you've planted ideas within us that are worthy of growing and that you would bring angels around us to quiet our doubts. Lord, let us grow at our own pace. Let us learn from nature and the trees who just do their job by design. And yet, the world is beautiful and breathtaking. Let us emulate that. Thank you for letting us be a part of it. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Amber. Thank you for the crew that's here today. Thank you for being flexible. A first for everything. And this is definitely a unique worship service. I want to just remind you before I give the benediction that we are going to be gathering in person for worship on September 12th. So next weekend is Labor Day weekend. And then we will have our first in-person and live stream service on September 12th. Uh, starting next week, we're going to launch a new series uh, just titled Walking with God. We're just going to look at walking with God in September, walking with one another in October, walking with those in need in November. And so next week, we're going to start a new series where we're going to really just look at how do we discover God's presence? How do we experience God's presence? How do we practice the presence of God each day? wherever we find ourselves. And I, I'm really looking forward to that. Um, and once again, want to thank Danell and thank, you know, Michael and Rebecca. We're, we're, we're having a little party here, so you can join the party in two weeks. Um, and uh, I invite you now to receive this benediction. I pray that you will step into this week knowing that Jesus is inviting you by name to follow him and to become like him, and to know that you have strengths and gifts and so much to contribute, not only to our world, but to God's kingdom, and that God loves you and is calling you by name. Let's pursue our assignments, and as we do, may the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be ours now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>